things about figuring out who Jesus was. It's, it's other nitty gritty details, the end time, all the cataclysms over a seven day period. It's one of these texts which doesn't talk about necessarily a, a person or a group, but it talks about an artifact. Uh, it's the 30 pieces of silver that Judas was given to betray Jesus. And it, it traces its origins. These 30 pieces of silver, they're like the Forrest Gump of biblical artifacts because they're everywhere in the history. Of the origin of the cross, for example, where that wood came from. And at the end of the text, they sudden, somehow transform into gold. It's never clear exactly why. And there were these gold pieces that were circulating and it's supposed to be one of the coins that Judas actually was paid. We have this Syrian king named Abgar, and he's sick, and he writes to Jesus. He says, I've heard about you and your ability to heal people. Can, can you help me out? And Jesus sends him a letter back saying, I'm a bit busy right now, but once I'm dead and I've ascended, I will send someone to you to heal you. And that's a weird thing, too, because you said he's as big about what's in the canon and what's not, but here he presents this letter as something genuine, yet it's not in the Bible. In this text, it has the correspondence, but it now tells the sequel, like what happens after. Abgar sends a messenger to, with the letter to Jesus, but also uh, sends an artist because he wants an image of Jesus as well. So the messenger comes back with, with the letter back from Jesus and the image. And now people talk about in various texts after that, but what happens to this image? But of course, uh, people who have dated the shroud say it comes from somewhere around the 12th century or 13th century, something like that. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm with Professor Tony Burke. He is a professor of early Christianity at York University in Toronto. And he's doing work that a lot of us just don't, can't do. You are putting together texts, apocryphal texts in English, translating them from their respective languages, Coptic, Syriac, Greek, and it's just incredible how much you've contributed to scholarship of early Christianity. It really is. It's, it's incredible. So I'm glad to have you here. Thanks. And um, yeah, let's get right into it. So, so some of the texts that you have translated. And before we even start, I just want to put this out there. Is it is, is it safe to say that you have a pre-order available for the third edition of these sure. texts? Uh, I think so. Um uh, certainly, it's listed on the the Urban's catalog, and it's probably uh, probably something similar on Amazon. I'm not sure. It's called New Testament Apocrypha, more non canonical scriptures, or just more New Testament Apocrypha for short. And um, the, the whole idea of it was, um, you often see, even in regular bookstores, um, compendia or collections of Apocrypha, and they tend to run from the first to the third century, right around you know, when the canon gets uh, formalized, roughly. And they tend to be the same texts all the time. Um, you know, you'll see the Gospel of Thomas and the Infancy Gospel of James and so on. So it's usually the early texts. And the idea of this volume was to, to publish the texts that people don't see very often. So, and that'll be, you know, a few texts that have been uh, recently um, uh found with it that still rests within the first or third centuries but most of them come after that so fourth fifth and even probably as late as uh, maybe we've gone as late as maybe the 12th can't remember what the latest one is um so that's why we call it more new testament apocrypha it's 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 ones that are additional we're not reprinting the same ones again and again right and some of these have appeared before but maybe a hundred years ago based on a couple of manuscripts and we've found lots more sense and we think we in those cases we think we can improve the text in some cases um there are some that have been published in the original language but not in not in english and in some cases they've never appeared in any language at all um so those are the, those are the nicest ones really because then we can do something that's quite new but the, again the idea is to give more to people who, uh these texts that, that that don't get enough attention or have not been published before Absolutely. And I have a link in the description right now. If you guys want to check those out, they're on Amazon. And this is just all in one place. You don't have to get this book over here and get that together. It's, you, you have them all in one spot. Two volumes and a third one coming out probably next year. So yes. Exciting. In spring. Um, and also on my own website, 
there's information about the books as well, which is just tonyburke.ca. Yep, I add that in the link in the description as well. So you'll have both of those links. Check out both of those links, anyone who's watching. And um, yeah, I'm sure you'll find some good stuff. Another one is the Syriac tradition of the infancy gospel of Thomas. That one you have translated on its own. Mm-hmm. Um, when, maybe we could start with that one. Sure. That's an interesting one. We'll tell, give us a little rundown about what this is. Well, um, the infancy gospel of Thomas is one of the, probably the earliest apocryphal texts, probably somewhere in the middle of the second century. Um, it's quite famous because uh, Jesus is portrayed in that text in uh, quite controversial ways. He's, the stories run from the ages of 5 to 12, so it f- fills in a little gap in the New Testament Gospels. And, uh, you know, sometimes Jesus does nice things, sometimes he does bad things. Uh, I think the classic story for me is the young Jesus, five years old, is walking through a marketplace and some boy bumps into his shoulder and Jesus strikes him down dead with a curse. Um, so this is not the conventional Jesus we're used to, right? Um, so sometimes he does some nice things. He'll, he'll you know, stretch a, a beam of wood for his father in the carpenter shop or, or carry some water home in his cloak because his, his jar broke. But otherwise, sometimes he's just, he's just smiting people. Um, so I, I started working on that text when I was in, uh, in graduate school uh, for my master's, and then I worked it into my PhD. And what I wanted to do with it, there's a whole bunch of uh, manuscripts that hadn't been published yet in Greek. And we believe it was originally composed in Greek. And um, that's the thing with when, when you study Apocrypha, um, we all tend to be text critics. We need to establish a text before we can do anything with it. And knowing that there are all these manuscripts out there, I thought, well, I can't do anything with this text unless I do the best possible work I can do to, to reconstruct the text as early as possible. And uh, uh, you can only go so far back, unfortunately, you know, as far back as the earliest manuscript. But but for for that text, the, the manuscripts of the time were published in from fifteenth uh, or sixteenth century, and I was able to use one from the eleventh, which was considerably better, and, and a bunch of others. Um, so that ended up being my thesis, and then and my my first book. Um, and I returned to the text back in two thousand seventeen. Uh, I think it's when it's published, to do uh, the Syriac version. And the Syriac version, the earliest manuscript for that is the 6th century, 5th or 6th century. And so we're getting quite a bit closer to the time of origin. Uh, it's not it's not its original language. So, you know, the, uh, the nitty-gritty word-for-word um, um, correspondence to its original form won't be there. But structurally, it's closer to the, probably the original text in, in that certain stories uh, were added to the tradition over time. So if you want to get as close as you can to this, the structure of the text, the Syriac is the way to go. And with the Syriac, there's lots and lots of other manuscripts published there too. Um, I think that's probably as far as I'm going to go with that text, because like, the other languages are Ethiopic and Georgian and um, it's even an Irish version. So it goes uh, wow. uh, out of my expertise, but uh, but those two are uh, kind of the most important um, text textual traditions um and again it's it's been good to, to be able to work on that material and, and other people have now been able to use it to, to do other things with the text um that become the standard kind of critical edition so it's, it's nice how far back do these syriac manuscripts go i know the greeks go pretty back pretty far but syriac i'm not sure about those you mean in general like the length the, the, yeah like the, the manuscript length. traditions when do you start seeing those pop up how 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 old do we have those i think the earliest we have is fourth or fifth century it's actually one of the the earliest dated manuscript we have uh i think for anything is a syriac christian manuscript of a of an apocryphal text surprisingly i think it's dated somewhere in the 400s so the fifth century um we have earlier manuscripts but not ones that have clear dates on them so we those we just kind of have to figure out. Um, so Syriac was a it's a language um, that is used in um, say like north northeast of of uh, ancient Israel, so pa- or Palestine, whichever term you want to use for it. Um, and it's still used in a few areas there t- today. So so in the overlap between um, Turkey and um, um, Syria, I think, if I got my my yeah. uh, uh, area right, um, and and an awful lot of Christian texts are written in Syriac. Um, it's very similar to Hebrew. Um, if you just change the the, the 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 alphabet over, 
from the Syriac alphabet to the Hebrew alphabet, you pretty much have Hebrew. It's very in oh, the same language class. Um, um, but yeah, and and a lot of our early Christian texts tend to survive in Syriac more plentifully than say Greek in some cases, because it's outside of of the the the, the Christian Empire as it was developing. Um, so sorry, for fourth century, fifth century, sixth century, and it was a while before the Syriac world kind of gets incorporated in that. So they can start, they can live a little freer and, and, and uh, uh, the Christianity can go, go a bit wilder until it gets kind of subsumed by, by the growing Catholic and uh, wow. uh, Eastern Orthodox empire. So we have, and it's those types of places where we tend to get apocryphal texts. So the outer reaches, right? So in Ethiopia, we get, we get some interesting texts and places like Georgia and Armenia and uh, in the Slavonic lands. And, um, not that we don't have Greek and we don't have Latin, but but some of our texts only survive in these outer reaches of the of the the European world. I would guess we could say. Yeah, because when you when you look at the history of the church in general, you know the tradition claims that it started off and according to the Book of Acts, you know the first people who were called Christians were in Antioch, Syria, and then you have to wonder if they're if they're in Antioch, Syria, are they? I get I get that Greek is the dominant language of the world, but like. Don't you think there'd be some Syriac things going on? But I mean, is what do you think about like Paul doesn't use the language, he uses Greek. So it's kind of like one of those things that makes you wonder how prevalent these other languages were early on. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Antioch is probably a bit too far west for the Syriac language, but it is kind of the gateway to to the east. And and uh, we get some uh church officials who had who are responsible for for missionizing to the east that, that, that are based in Antioch. So it's kind of the, the borderland. So in Antioch, you're probably um, primarily speaking Greek and there's probably some native languages as well. I can't exactly recall, but I don't think Syriac would be used there. Um, but there's a Jewish community there who have been, would have been uh, speaking Ar Aramaic at the time, which is close to, to Hebrew and Syriac. Um, but just, uh, but I don't think Syriac would be used, but again, it's still a gateway area for sure. Yeah. And, um, is it, if I'm not mistaken, I think there is there a Luke manuscript that's called like the Peshito. It's in Syriac. Where, uh, what's, what's, the, what's the deal with this one? That's uh, um, that's the entire gospel. So when we when we think of the gospel tra transmission into Syriac, we get uh, we we have a few manuscripts that are in Old Syriac. So that would be a very early. Um, it's Syriac, but it's the old Syriac translation. So the earliest translation into Syriac of the Gospels, and we only have a few um witnesses to that usually i think they're only in uh palimpsest so it's this there's older writing over top of it and we can see the underlying writing and it's this old these old syriac versions of the gospels and then it gets revised i think around the fifth century um to something a bit more um official so this will now be the official translation going forward and that's called the peshita version and then there's another one after that called the harclean version um so certainly the scholars are really excited if they can find witnesses to the old Syriac because it, it gets us closer to um, the Gospels as they were tra being transmitted in the early few centuries. Um, what, by the time you get to the Peshit, the, the, the trying to, you know, uh, in, um, smooth out readings and, and make it a bit more um, what would be considered official. And we get that everywhere. Like, you know, this, this started to be a, a kind of an official um, Greek text of the Bible, the Byz what we call the Byzantine text. We get uh, Jerome coming up with a standard uh, Latin uh um translation and when jerome was doing it he was he was told that there are many um latin translations of the bible before him as there were manuscripts of it so everyone every manuscript is different so there needed to be some kind of standardization but if you go to these older latin trans latin translations we again find these interesting readings that make us that can help us get a bit closer to the original text so the, the standardization process, no matter where it is, and you know whether it's Greek, Latin, or, or or Syriac, it certainly smooths over some of the variant readings that could be quite early. And so we we like to get back behind these official versions to the older versions. Interesting. Now another thing I want to talk about is these various apocryphal stories of John. John seems to be very popular in this time period. I mean, he's credited for writing a Revelation. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but um. Anyways, the fact that they're putting his name on it, he's a character that people are, you know, putting up very high as, as far as like Peter and Paul and John. And um, he's got all these stories written about him, Apocryphal Apocalypse of John. 
There's different versions of it. There's the dialogue of the revealer and John. Can you tell us about this a little bit? Sure. Um, let's think back first to, to, to author of Revelation versus the Gospels. Like there is this tradition that John wrote a gospel, but his name's not really on it except for the title. So I don't really know he wrote it. Um, but tradition has stated that it was John because tradition likes to place a, you know, an authoritative figure on the text as they develop over time. But when it comes to the book of Revelation, that there is a name John on that text, but uh, the, ne the author never says he's the apostle John. So we generally call him John of Patmos because he's living on the island of Patmos or, or John the Revealer or something along those lines. Um, though, you know, that's all well and good for scholars to say it's not the apostle John. And it's all well and good for the text to say that, but tradition has kind of combined these figures right. generally. Um, um, now, when it comes to uh, the, the text in, in these volumes, in our second volume, we have, uh, what is it, uh, four um, sequels to the book of Revelation, essentially. Um, um, one, two, three, Apocryphal, Apocalypse of John, and there's one called The Questions of James to John the, in the same basic tradition. It's essentially like, someone looks at revelation and says uh well, what else could could jesus tell john about the afterlife or about about the uh the the cataclysm to come and so that we have more revelations um a lot of the content is you know way out of john's original um time period like it's asking about things related to to liturgy and uh, so you know what you do in in mass and what do you do what monks should wear or where they should live so it's way out of john's timeline so it's a bit silly it's, it's it's not, it's not, not, not to cut you off but the funny part about that is john's talk the the guy who wrote up the revelations talking about the world's about to end now this guy's saying okay let's settle down let's figure out how we're gonna how we're gonna run these churches big difference <laughs> yeah, yeah for sure um but you know the reason you get this kind of thing is because you, you want to establish some rules and what better way to get people to follow the rules than for jesus himself to say them right we get that you know when the in the old testament uh, Christ, uh christian old testament or hebrew bible you have all the laws go to moses because well, he's the prototypical lawgiver so no matter what it is let's put it in moses's mouth and so you get that with these kind of texts as well so whenever there's some new change in the community let's get let's have jesus reveal it and then suddenly wow we look look we found this text um and uh that now we have all, all the rules we need um now these uh, these apocalypses that we published in the second volume the first what we call the first apocalypse of john that's fairly widespread like there's quite a lot of manuscripts of that but the other one and, and it had been published before but we did a, a new fresh translation but the other ones um either had not been well Two have been published on very few manuscripts, but the one that I worked on in particular, so there are a few in here I, I do work on. It's a, it's, you know, it's a collected volume, but there's a few texts I actually work on. Uh, is we call it the third Apocryphal Apocalypse of John, and that hasn't appeared anywhere before. Um, so it's wow. nice to include that. Um, but it's mostly about questions about the afterlife, like what kind of bodies do we have? And, and will we recognize our spouses or our children? And those kinds of odd questions you might have. What, um, there's, there's even a question about uh, the type of body we would have. What color would we be? What age would we be? And all those kinds of questions. Um, do you? Yeah, by any chance, Sorry. Do you by any chance? Do you by any chance rem remember what is exact, exactly he says about some of those details? Because this is this is not. You can't find details like this in the New Testament or the Old Testament. No. They pretty much say nothing about what's going to happen in the world to come. But this text actually does try to you know attempt to do that. Is there anything in there that you um that you think is interesting about the how he describes it? Um, not a lot off the top of my head, but I, um, there is this sense that, and we find it in several texts, not just these Revelation to John texts. I think there's two of them that talk about this. But the the bodies that we have, I think it's it's the age of thirty. It seems to be like the what, what uh, is considered the 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 ideal age. And of course, it's probably written by people who are. You know, are we around that age or, or, or look back to that age as their best time in their lives? Right. Um, one of them does talk about, about skin color. And I think it's that everyone will be will be white, I think, um, which, you know, unfortunate. Um, but yeah, so it gives you a sense of what people think of as the cultural ideal where, where these texts were written. Sure. Um, so those are the kinds of things I think about first. Um, but other details, not so clear. But why this stuff isn't in the New Testament, like, um, the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, and the New Testament, they were developed at a time when, when concepts of the afterlife were really not completely fleshed out. There was this sense, 
that there would be some kind of future apocalypse of some sort or Jesus and God comes into the world and takes the faithful and uh, takes them to a, a good place and, and uh, the wicked go to a bad place. But that's something that happens at the end of time. So bef early on, people would go to the shadowy underworld or something, but it's only at the at the the end time where people go either to a good place or a bad place but when christians christians started to realize this end time is not coming anytime soon um they that they put the end the the place of, of uh, paradise and place of torture into the present as soon as you die so when that concept becomes operative that's when you start to have to answer such questions about exactly what what do we look like when we go into the afterlife and, and will we recognize our friends and so on and so forth um, so it's, it's, it's a developing concept that, that gets worked out actually in apocryphal texts and, you know, church far the texts and so on, but it's, it's certainly, it's not in the new Testament and the old Testament. There's vague references to the underworld, but that's it. Um, so yeah, it's something that, that, that's, uh, that certainly comes later and, and we see the great effect in our text. Yeah. It's very interesting. It makes you wonder if the reason why they're putting this in the mouth of, of john do you think this could be they think this is the got the um the apostle whom jesus loved possibly because they don't really say who that is no but yeah you're right so that but the tradition earlier on does identify him as the beloved disciple but if we wanted to go right back to the gospel of john it's it's really difficult excuse yeah. me, to figure out who that is supposed to be um um I think it's more they chose him because of the book of Revelation and anything else. So because it already gives us a setting for why Jesus would well, well it gives us a setting for Jesus talking to John about end time things or or afterlife things. And so uh, that's the John that becomes the person in these texts rather than say uh the John of the Gospel of John, uh where whoever well, wherever he may be in there. Um and not because they're, 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 just, they're, they're, they're not thinking about the beloved disciple so much, but they are thinking much more about John the Revealer. Uh, the term usually used for him in these texts is John the Theologian. Um, so that's the John that they want to use because uh, it's, 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 again, it's like it provides a setting for the same type of information to be provided. That's interesting. There's also a text called the Mysteries of John. Is this sort of uh, similar to these other apocryphal apocalypse texts or different? A little bit different. Um, so the apocalypses come from uh, the Greek world. They're all written in Greek. The the mysteries of John is Coptic, and and it comes um, fr so it's from Egypt and and developed a little bit uh, in, in a particular time period, somewhere around the fifth or sixth century, and is part of or it has connections with this group of literature which is called by scholars the, the pseudo apostolic memoirs or the apostolic memoirs, and it's a uh, it's, it's a really interesting corpus of texts. There's, I can't remember how many there are, but there's a couple of dozen of them. They're all written around the fifth or sixth century. And so after the, the canon is formed, so this is text written by what we would call Orthodox Christians. Um, but, you know, they wrote Apocrypha too. Um, it's not just people that the, the, the Orthodox didn't like and called heretics. It's just everybody was writing Apocrypha texts. But um, this group of texts, they tend to follow a certain structure where you'll get someone who is a uh, an important figure in the church, say Cyril of Jerusalem or Basil of Caesarea, fourth century uh, figures, and they deliver a homily on a particular occasion. So let's say it's the uh, the feast of the Dormition of Mary when Mary uh, went to sleep or died, and so they'll introduce this homily saying, you know, on this great occasion, blah blah blah, and I want to tell you some more about Mary, and uh, let me tell you about this text that I found in Jerusalem, and then gives the entire text. So it's a small, what we call a homiletic framework, a beginning and end, and then the body of it is this pretend text. So it's the, the actual writer of the homilist is not the person whose name is on it. So it's a fake homily with a fake text in the middle of it. So it's this weird kind of concentric circles of things. Um, but the whole point of creating this text is to establish things like festivals or, or an origin story for a particular uh, new church that has been created. Uh, Something to, to to build Christianity in 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 Egypt. So establish churches, establish festivals, all these other things. And there's usually some things in there at the end about um, some way to honor the particular person, like you know, to give some money to this church or or um, um, do some other kind of act of piety. It's all about building this 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 religion. So anyway, long story. But the mysteries of John is kind of within that corpus of text, and it uses John again as this revealer figure. Um, 
but it's much more centered in, in Egyptian lore about, um, it talks about the Nile, um, talks about seasons and, 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 uh, um, uh, that are, you know, particular to the area, but it also, uh, it's got, uh, uh, I think I remember correctly, there's a cherubim in there who John rides on to, to go see the heavens. And, um, so it's much more of a, a cosmological apocalypse where you get to see pla different places in the heavens. And that's some of the type of apocalypses we get. Um, there are two, just briefly, there are two main apocalypses. One where it tells all about, you know, calamities at the end of the world, end time stuff, afterlife stuff. Another one is a tour of the heavens and hell. And this is much more along those lines. John gets to see various places in the heavens uh, taken by this this cherubim, this this, this divine creature who will, will show him various uh, things. So interesting text, a little bit, certainly a different kind of cultural context than the other ones. Um, yeah, but it's a fascinating group of texts that we we've, we're only really starting to examine in great detail, and and the three volumes of the books we of the Morton Testament Apocrypha series has several of these texts within it that have either never been published or never been translated before. So it's nice to be able to add to that developing area of scholarship. It's very interesting. This John, did you think this John that they're portraying? Because it's obviously not. This is obviously is someone else writing this, like you mentioned. Is he aligned with the thinking of Paul, or is there anything different about him? Uh, I think by this point, um, uh, um, orthodoxy has developed, the church has developed, so the, 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 um, the, the, everyone is kind of presented as if they've always kind of gotten along. It's, it's, a, it's a group of apostles that includes Paul, and, every, and you've got the Bible fully formed, all those texts combined into one book. So the, the differences between all, all these characters is just kind of um, um, overlooked. So, uh, because this is in, you know, as I said, these are later texts, they're in the Orthodox tradition. So they, 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 they like everybody. Earlier texts show more sectarian division. So sure. you'll have, um, for a really good example of this, you have some Jewish Christian texts that, that align themselves with James, sometimes with Peter. You, and you got, you got James saying that it's, it's about doing the works, not just about faith, do the works too. And then you have Paul and Roman saying, just have faith, everything will be fine. And yeah. You can see there's a you can it almost looks like they're responding to each other if you read if you put James side by side with Romans. Yeah, it's a, a classic example of that. And you know, and you put them in together in one book and you you the differences get get uh, kind of muffled, right? But if you read them right side by side, it's like this these are completely diametrically opposed to one another on this issue. But in the apocryphal text, you we have um think of the say the Pauline community and the James community continuing to develop separately. And we see in these apocryphal texts aligned with James um some pretty negative portrayals of paul so and um you know i want you to think too about how these figures become spokespeople or representatives of the communities so if you have a text with james not getting along with paul it's really the james community of this text against the gentile or orthodox you might say community connected around paul so personalities and texts are often connected with with groups um, and it shows the continuing conflict between them so Jewish Christian texts championing James, sometimes Peter, versus uh, Gentile Christian or, or emerging Orthodox Christian texts where Paul is at the center. And they just kind of, you know, say nasty things about one another. That's, that's very, it's very fascinating when you put it that way, because that's definitely a good way to put it. This, you got just Paul, he, he understands. And maybe it's because he's from Turkey, because he says he's from, you know, Paul from uh, Tarsus. But he understands like what these people are into interested in and how to speak to them how to sell them basically and then you got james who's just sticking right to his guns like no no we this is what we do this is a, this is the tradition and so you end up getting this sort of pauline ideas of christianity and james but which brings me to this point is now you get these texts about john they're they're not as widely known most of my people most people watch this probably not probably never even read one of them yeah. um and so the the uh, the orthodoxy develops and is there anything about these texts that i don't know stand out to you that maybe some people might be uh you know interested in hearing that might sound interesting um you know i i, I like to think so but it, but it's much more i think an interest like we're, we're moving into like the byzantine world by which i mean like eighth ninth century greece right so yeah. it's got all the uh, certain 
concerns of that particular time period and interest. So it's it is all about things like liturgy and so on. So it it doesn't have the types of um, like those conflicts that we're talking about, which is quite juicy. It's one of the t things I really like about about uh, whether it's canonical, non-canonical texts. I'm really into the, the conflicts. So, you don't see conflicts so much in those texts, unfortunately. It's it's working out the uh, how we do the things we do and using New Testament characters in order to get the ideas across. So um, I think they're interesting because we all have this um, these questions about the afterlife, for example. Uh, and so th we get those these little answers in there about that. And so that, that, I think that is interesting. Um, but it's not those kinds of sectarian divisions which which, which we get in the earlier texts, where, yeah. where or things about figuring out who Jesus was. It's it's other nitty gritty details. Sure. Um, so if you think of orthodoxy as essentially figured out who they think Jesus is and what level of divinity versus humanity there is, and now it's about, it's about other things that they're trying to figure out. And so um, questions of historical Jesus and so on are kind of left behind at this point. Yeah, do that. Does do, do these texts address the Trinity or anything about the, 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 Jesus's divinity in in particular, or is it very sort of like doesn't really go into that as much? Yeah, it's kind of settled <laughs> by the time we get to this point. Um, so, and you know, this is one of the things about the series and and where my field is generally. Most of us in the field. Uh, we're a little bit tired of looking at those early texts to some extent. And we want to look at these later texts and connect them with, with particular communities in the later Christian world and medieval thought and so on. But the, the downside of that is then you start to uh, limit your audience in some ways where it's, it's the less sensational things right. that are being uh, discuss, discussed. But one of the things I, I really like about later Apocrypha is for, for one thing that people are still doing them. Like, you know, you always get this sense that once the canon is settled around the fourth century, every, uh, the Apocrypha is supposed to be destroyed and now we're just supposed to use, you know, the canon. But that's not the way it happened. Um, new texts keep getting written. We get people writing sermons using apocryphal texts. So if anyone wants to talk about, want to talk about hell, for example, they will draw on hell related literature. If anyone wants to talk about Mary, they'll talk about uh, her birth and her death, which comes from apocryphal literature. So it's uh, either the manufacturing new texts or the using old texts in order to continue telling these stories. Um, so we we are very much interested in, in these later periods and the late things that the people are working out. But I wonder how much of the wider public finds that as interesting as like, you know, Jesus smiting children in the marketplace or or those kinds of things. Um, and we also get throughout in the later period, we get uh, uh, apocryphal texts and stories being in, uh, introduced into art, into iconography, um, plastic arts, like, you know, like, um, like um, uh, chests, for example, that would hold things. You can see decoration on the drawn apocryphal texts. So that's one of the things that, that we also find interesting is, is to see how these texts start to in, uh, influence culture. Um, which we, we don't see in those first several centuries. Yeah. And so this opens this world for us where, where we see that people are not, as, are not confined to canonical stories and texts. When if they go to a church, they might see images from apocryphal texts or they'll, 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 um, they'll go to um, the marketplace and see plays based on apocryphal texts. So that kind of interplay is, is what I think is interesting about the later centuries that we don't see in those, those earliest of centuries. Yeah, that's a very good point. Because even there's even pastors today in certain denominations of churches will will tell stories about the church fathers, or you know they'll, they'll just tell stories about what happened with the martyrs, and that's not in the Bible. And a lot of these a lot of these pastors or ministers will oftentimes say, "Oh, you know, we don't want to focus on apocryphal texts. We just want to focus on the canon." But they they don't even like they'll just slip up and do it just because, like it's just part of their history. And it's interesting how they people try to draw the line, but you really can't. You kind of have to go in both areas to talk about the history of this church. Mm -hmm. And some texts over time have been far more valuable, some apocryphal texts, than some canonical texts. Like hardly anyone was reading Jude, uh, you know, one of those last letters in the New Testament, but everyone was reading the Infancy Gospel of James, which is about Mary's birth. So, very, very popular text. So how do you say that one text is authoritative and the other is not just based on the canon? Because um, that's not how people seem to work. Yeah. Um, 
uh, I, when thinking about uh, modern kind of context, um, my my wife goes to a, a United Church and they do a Christmas pageant every year. Like, you know, they do a play, right? And I said, you, you guys should just do the Infancy Gospel of James because it'll be so much more interesting. You get the backstory of Mary. Um, you get the famous, you know, nativity scene with the ox and the ass and stuff. And I think they would go for it in a sense because, you know, United Church is a bit, you know, wishy-washy about stuff. Um, but if I can convince them, I think that'd be really fun. Yeah. A good teachable yeah. moment. Well, I mean, if you read the book of Jude, for example, which is in every standard church, which is every standard Bible, it's not like only the Catholics read it. They all read Jude. And that's quoting directly from Enoch. Sure. So even just by default, you're going to be getting into apocryphal text. And then they want, if you want to talk about the martyrs, the martyrs is a big deal because people look at the martyrs as they nobody would willingly go to the go to the cross if they didn't believe this stuff. So you can't talk about martyrs without talking about some church history that's not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. so you have to, it's almost like you can't just pick and choose what you want. If you want to get it like this, the these stories sort of um they sort of build the canon sort of goes outside of itself. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like we don't know um what Jesus would have thought would be canonical. Like right. it's a saying in Luke about the prophets, uh, is it the law of the prophets? And the Psalms, and he's thinking of that third, that's kind of a, an easy way of saying the third group of what we call the writings, which is the fluid part of the Hebrew Bible. So in Jesus' day, it wasn't the, the, the boundary wasn't completely settled. And so that's why someone writing Jude, for example, is drawing on First Enoch, which is a very popular text at the time period, but it eventually did not make the cut. But it just shows that it's, it was still in development. The Hebrew Bible was still in development at that time. And then we have various versions of that canon as well. Um, the Greek version versus the Hebrew version, for example. Um, and there are some fluctuations even for the New Testament past the fourth century. Like there's a bunch of Latin Bibles that have the, uh, the letter to the Laodiceans in it, which is a, um, a, a letter that Paul refers to in the, the canonical Colossians, but we don't otherwise have. But someone said, well, let's fill that in. We'll create one. And so some pe for some people, Laodiceans was canonical. And you know, you go in some other places like Syria and they had a third Corinthians and they didn't have revelation. Um, eventually these, these, these differences kind of work themselves out, but even today in Ethiopia, there's a few extra uh, New Testament texts and a few extra uh, Hebrew Bible texts. So I tend to tell my students, if you're gonna talk about the canon, you always have to qualify that. It's, I, I mean the canon in this area in this particular time, because there's still you know, this fluidity in various times and places that people, and again, as we just talked about, some places people didn't care what was in the canon, what wasn't in the, in the canon as well. Yeah, interesting. Now you also have an apocalypse of Thomas. This is one I haven't touched yet. Do you, what, is this a, how, what, what's, what's the deal with this text? Uh, I think it was written in, in Latin and it was, it was uh, popular in the Western church, particularly in Ireland, actually. Um, and it essentially rolls out the the end time, all the cataclysms in, over a seven day period. So it's very much, you know, indebted to the book of Revelation, which right. is like, you know, exactly what happens every day. Um, it comes in a couple of versions, a short version, a long version. Um, and uh, um, one of the things that, that interests me particularly about this is that uh, we actually have a manuscript of this in Toronto. Um, Canada doesn't have a lot of apocryphal manuscripts <laughs> um, because, you know, most of them are in European libraries. But I was I was uh, with a group of students um, where we go, went to what's called the Fisher uh, Rare Book Library at the University of Toronto. And so they, they arrayed out for us a bunch of um, um, biblical manuscripts they had and some early printed Bibles. And they also had this and a few other manuscripts of interest. So it was really cool to be able to see an apocryphal manuscript that's in our own hometown, so to speak. Um, wow. But yeah, pretty influential in the Western church. Uh, some, we have some other texts that draw upon it. Um, um, but it's the, the, the contents of it are, are uh, again, it, more for a niche group of scholars who are interested in particular things. And this is just the signs of the end time as they play out over this, 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 uh, these, in this number of days until the very end. I'm not, sure, I'm not even sure why Thomas's name is on it, for, but uh, I was I just wondering that actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause we tend to think about Thomas as being connected with, with, with Gnostic stuff to, to some, to some extent, like the gospel of Thomas or the book of Thomas. Um, 
And there again, you have, I think, sectarian interests. I think the people who created those early Thomas texts were in a group that saw Thomas as their patron saint, so to speak. But, but after you know the, the church takes uh, church is in control of, of the empire and then sp spreads its influence out, those kinds of things start to fall away, and it becomes again the apostles all as a group all getting along together. So you can pick and choose what it, whichever person you want, and it really doesn't indicate sectarian interests anymore. That's interesting. And um, as far as John goes, I'm sorry, Thomas goes. Is he mostly venerated in, by the Egyptians near Alexandria or somewhere else? two places well um generally we tend to connect them with syria um but there's two two but both of those areas um are, are possible so the gospel of thomas for example all of our evidence comes from egypt um we have a few uh, three scraps in greek of the gospel of thomas and then the coptic te text um and then uh, the book of thomas which was found also in that Kamadi, so that's a coptic version of that text um but um in Syria, we get the Acts of Thomas, which tells all about Thomas's missionary work. And um, is there anything else in Syria? I think that's it. But so we have Thomas traditions in Syria, Thomas traditions in Egypt. So um, before the Gospel of Thomas was widely known, we tended to associate Thomas with Syria because we, were, we, we knew more about the Acts of Thomas literature. So now we have to figure out what, what do we do with the Gospel of Thomas since it's you know now connected with Egypt. So some people will say, well, it moved there from Syria which is possible, or maybe it moved from Egypt to Syria. Um, all we know about the Thomas Christians in Syria is that they really like Thomas stuff. So they, they could have gotten that from other places. They didn't have to write it all there. Um, but those are the two, two the, the twin locations for what we call the Thomas school is either in Egypt or you know, origin wise, origins in Egypt or origins in Syria, but certainly it becomes more uh, of a, uh, the popular place becomes syria where he's really connected to to his his identity is really connected to that land that's interesting you sort of see early on there's these two major hubs i guess maybe three i guess maybe rome too because it's rome but it seems like for me at least from my point of view it seems like alexandria egypt and syria are really where these christian culture takes off what is your opinion on that yeah, I think so. And it's interesting that these are the places that Luke doesn't mention in, in the book of Acts. So Luke is talking about, uh, That's very where, uh, yeah, so Jerusalem, Antioch, um, some places in Greece. Um, he talk, does talk about Rome at the end, um, but he doesn't talk about how, how Christianity got there. Paul goes there and he finds some Christians there. He never talks about Alexandria, never talks about Syria. So um, I, I tend to look at Acts as kind of the reflection of Christians, Christian individual Christian groups coming together in some way. So Acts represents to me the Christian groups by the early second century that have joined together. They're connected. Rome is connected. Uh, Samaria, Jerusalem, these are all connected because Luke deals with all of them, but he doesn't know much about what's going on in Alexandria and he doesn't know anything about Syria. So they're kind of outside of his interest. By the time you get, you know, by the fourth century, they're all together in some way, but not at this point. Um, but yeah, they are kind of the hubs. And you know, Alexandria is the place where you have the you know the great library. Um, all the the learned Greeks are there, so it would be a natural center for Christian intellectuals um, to 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 work. Um, you know, converted from um, uh, paganism, so to speak, Greco-Roman uh, culture uh, to Christianity, and and drawing upon all of those. Uh, um, the, the ideas and techniques that were around. So, um, so you get people like Clement of Alexandria there and Origin, Origin of Alexandria. These are the, the big thinkers. And these are also the people who, who also talk about apocryphal texts. Uh, some, some of our apocryphal texts are only known in quotations by these writers, for example, like the Gospel of the Hebrews and the Gospel of the Egyptians. We only know in quotations by these writers. And Syria is another place. Um, you know, they had uh, Syria had a fairly large Jewish community, so it's fertile soil for Christianity to take root. But here it is taking root in a much more Jewish-based uh, area, and also, you know, the native uh, religions of that area kind of coming together in a bit of a goulash there. Uh, and I would say Rome would be that other power center because um, uh, it fairly early on becomes, uh, um, you know, it's where Peter and Paul ended up dying. It becomes the center of of orthodoxy from that point on. So those three centers are the ones that kind of are gonna be uh, 
uh, jockeying for power with one another for a few centuries before uh, Rome uh, is the is the major center by the fourth century. Have you ever considered the possibility, the fact that Alexandria doesn't get mentioned in some of these texts, that maybe it's being written in Alexandria, and when you're writing something, you're not writing about where you are, you're writing about other places. Is that possible, maybe? Well, I think what we think about it is, it's a good point, but but texts about certain places tend to talk about themselves. Yeah. So they say, um, you know, the Acts of Thomas, for example, I said it's in Syria. In that text, Thomas comes to Edessa in Syria and then moves from there into India. So, so they're really interested in trying to establish their origins and base it on a particular apostle. So that's that's what we tend to do. We do get, say, a text called the Acts of Mark, which is in our third volume, actually, or second. <laughs> they all blend together now. Um, I think it's in the third, um, which does talk about Mark coming to Alexandria and establishing Christianity there, but it's a fairly late text. Um, so Eusebius also has in his history of the church, Mark and Peter, as he says, I'm not, I mean, obviously he could be making this up, but he says Mark and Peter went to Alexandria to write the first gospel. Yeah. So yeah. at least the, 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 they're at least trying to make you, you know, at least putting that in the tradition, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So by Eusebius time, by the fourth century, probably every place has an, has a, an origin story for, for their particular Christianity. Yeah. Um, What's I think most interesting, if it's an earlier text, it's it's really a homegrown uh, origin story rather than something that's uh, imposed later, um, just for as a way for orthodoxy to claim places as being their own. Um, so yes, there's probably some fairly early traditions about Mark being connected to Alexandria, but we don't get a fully fleshed out story of that until after Eusebius's time. Um, yeah, and that's and that's that's a long time later. Yeah. But the reason why I bring that up, and I, um, is I've always, when I look at the gospel, let, let's say Mark is the, let's, let's say we agree that Mark is the first gospel. Sure. Mark is very the, this this is a very, um, in my opinion, very well put together. It's scholarly. It's drawing from sources from the Old Testament. It's also polemicizing things outside of the Old Testament and other Orphic, Orphic tradition. I think so. I, to me, for me, someone to put together a document like this is not just sitting in like a cave somewhere. Mm -hmm. I, I, my hypothesis is this is somewhere, maybe somewhere like Alexandria in the library, maybe somewhere else though. But my mm -hmm. point is, I think this is a high level scholarly text with a lot of sources. What is your opinion on that? Yeah, it's interesting how, how uh, opinions change on this. Like it used to be that Mark was considered, uh, a, a pretty crappy text. Um, right. The author has no skill. He's just throwing right. stuff together without any thought about how it really joins together. But over time, scholars have reversed that position and said, no, there's some pretty sophisticated things going on here, some interesting structures and so on. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think the general con consensus of sorts is that, that Mark was writing perhaps in Rome, but it's mostly based on you know traditions about Peter going to Rome. Um, Alexandria is a certainly a possibility. Generally, we think it's he's somewhere outside uh, Judea because he doesn't seem to know the geography very well. Um, but uh, I think from, uh, for most scholars, I think, or at least the scholars that I tend to be in contact with, Mark is their favorite gospel because um, it's got a cranky Jesus. It's got no birth story. It's got no resurrection story. It ends in a very mysterious way. There's lots of mystery in it. Jesus is always saying, you know, uh, to his apostles, I'll tell you what these parables mean, but don't tell anybody else. It's a very secretive kind of a Jesus. Right. Um, so, it, and, and less theologically developed, not that it's, that doesn't mean it's not sophisticated, but it, it's a little bit earlier from the time of trying to figure out exactly how Jesus relates to God and what the Holy Spirit is and all that other stuff. Uh, so there's so many questions that the text leaves us that it, it, that's why I think it's the most interesting. By the time you get to Matthew and Luke, they're, they're starting to work out some of the finer uh, points of Christology to some extent, and they're um, they're toning down some of the um, the weirdness of that Mark has. He's less secretive, for example. Uh, he doesn't get angry quite as often as he does in Mark. And we have some resurrection stories and some birth stories. Um, so yeah, Mark is far more interesting text, I think, than the other Gospels. And it, would, it makes sense for Mark to be that way and have its problems the way it does if it's really the first text, because you're not just going to have a masterpiece right off the rip. 
it's gonna it's gonna have to develop into a refined Luke, for example, or mm-hmm. Matthew, maybe. So I think it makes more sense that Mark would be the first one. He's batting first, you know. He 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 has a couple a couple swings and misses, but he's put, he puts together the template for what becomes arguably the greatest literally piece in Western history. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. as far as like you know, as far as how well known. I'm not saying it's like it's, I think Shakespeare's better, my personally, but I'm saying like as far as like how how it reached how it changed the world. So yeah, the legend of 30 pieces of silver is uh another text in the second volume. Um it's in the first actually. Oh, it's in the first. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, so, yeah, that's right. It's volume 1. Um what is this about? Uh this is something uh that I came across um just doing some research and I, think, and I saw the title and I said I don't know what I've never heard of this thing before. And it wasn't wasn't widely known um before uh, I started working on it, and my colleague Slavomir Chiklo. Um, but it's it, it's one of these texts which doesn't talk about necessarily a, a person or a group, but it talks about an artifact. Uh, it's the thirty pieces of silver that Judas was given to betray Jesus, and it it traces its origins and it goes through all th- these thirty pieces of silver. They're like the Forrest Gump of um, if anyone will understand that reference anymore, um, of, of uh, biblical artifacts, because they're everywhere in the history. Um, so they're, they were uh, minted by Abraham. They that's, a were, good, that's a good analogy. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, uh, minted by Abraham, they were, um, uh, they were used to, to, for Solomon to create the temple. They were given to the Queen of Nubia, blah, blah, blah. And eventually they make their way back to uh, Judea, where uh, Judas is given them to by the temple priest to to betray Jesus. So it's it's yeah, it's interesting that these pieces um, intersect all the time like that. We have a few other texts that with similar things. We'll we'll have the origin of the cross, for example, where that wood came from, and it intersects in certain points in history too. Um, but one of the things I particularly like about it is that uh, at the end of the text, they sudden somehow transform into gold it's never clear exactly why and um there were these gold pieces that were circulating throughout the medieval period that were said to be they're usually called judas pennies they're coins and it's supposed to be one of the coins that judas actually um was paid wow um and I, I imagine this text is kind of going hand in hand with the coins you can see it as kind of its certificate of authenticity um, where you can you can have a coin that you bought, and and here's the story of where that came from and how it came to you. Just you know, there's a lot of steps in between the you know when Judas uses the coins and then gives them back at the end, and when you get the coin. But but at least you have that 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 point at the end of the text where it says that the coins get dispersed and that they are gold, and now you have the gold and Judas penny. Um, so you have lots and lots of these, more, far more than thirty, of course. Um, um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, we kind of interplay between a text and, and an artifact. That's interesting. Now, is there any, does anybody raise this concern as why is there more than 30 pieces of gold here like, or not? Well, you'd have, that's the thing. You'd have to be able to, we now today can collect all these things we ha- uh, or as many as we can. As we can. We see that there's, there's too many. Similar right. kind of thing with, with, with body relics. So, you know, there's four arms of Andrew, three heads of John the Baptist and so on. Uh, but in your own little area, you'd never know there was another one. Or if you wow. had heard of it, you'd say, oh, no, ours is the real one. And that one's a fake. That's um, usually. Now, but, yeah. that, that reminds me of the shroud thing. When does this sort of tradition of like all these relics popping up everywhere is this a medieval thing or is this before is this early on um fairly early on there's a um there's a i think the earliest one is related to the story uh the correspondence between abgar and jesus which you may have heard of yes yep with the syrian king named abgar and he's sick and he writes to jesus he says i've heard about you and your ability to heal people can can you help me out and jesus sends him a letter back saying i'm a bit busy right now um, but once I'm dead and I've ascended, uh, I've risen from the grave, I will send someone to you to heal you. Um, and he sends, according to the correspondence, an apostle named Thaddeus, uh, who's one of the 12, according to Mark and Matthew, but not Luke. Um, so we have this, this, this tradition and it's even in, uh, the earliest witness to it is in Eusebius. Surprisingly, he, he, he translates it into Greek. He says from Syriac. 
And that's a weird thing too, because you said he's as big about what's in the canon and what's not, but here he presents this letter as something genuine, yet it's not in the Bible. Um, but anyway, we have a development a little further on in Syria in a text called the Doctrine of Adai. And in this text, uh, it, it has the correspondence, but now tells the sequel, like what happens after. Uh, it's The apostle's name is not Thaddeus, it's Adai, but it's similar. And um, um, it rewrites the correspondence in a little, uh, a little with it in that it gets in that Abgar sends uh, a messenger to with the letter to Jesus, but also uh, sends an artist because he wants an image of Jesus as well. So the messenger comes back with with the letter back from Jesus and the image. And now people talk about in various texts after that, but what happens to this image? Um, so that's one early image, and then there's the there's the a tradition of Veronica. Um, uh, if you're Catholic or if you've been to a Catholic church, you might have seen the 12 stages of the cross where, you know, uh, you know one of them is where Simon the Canaanian helps Jesus carry the cross. But one of them is uh, a woman named Veronica in tradition uh, who wipes Jesus' face. And so in, in, that's a more of a Western tradition. In the Western tradition, we have uh, the, the, the image that Veronica gets of Jesus' face. Um, so we have that one, we have the, the, the Syriac one, which is usually referred to as the Mandelian. We have another one that apparently Luke uh, uh, is said to have painted and that's in Rome. And some of these still exist. The one in Rome uh, still exists or it's supposed to be a copy, I can't remember exactly which it is. So sometimes we have the originals, sometimes we have the copies. So some people who are, who, who are interested in the shroud will try to connect the shroud with, with one or the other of these images. But of course, uh, people who have dated the shroud say it comes from somewhere around the 12th century or 13th century something like that and it's not a, a, an ancient uh, relic we don't know exactly what it is but it's not ancient um uh so certainly there's this re big interest in in ha in seeing what jesus looks like and having some kind of image because of course you can't have a relic of jesus if jesus you know beams up into into heaven after he dies so you need what's called a contact relic something that has touched him and these are great contact relics in that they, they, they impress an image of them at the same time in some magical way. Right. Like it's, it's something that doesn't happen anywhere else in any time period or history. There's no, there's no like shroud of Julius Caesar or shroud of the Buddha. It's only Jesus for some reason. It's like, it's like, is this even a thing? That's even, like, it sounds, it just sounds so made up, doesn't it? Well, I think it's, it's in part to do with pilgrimage because, you know, once again, the, religion is the religion of the empire they start building churches and so on and they want people to come to their churches and the best way to get people to come is to have something there for them to see so they'll have you know andrew's arm uh, uh a, a piece of the true cross is very popular you know i don't know if you know but if you put all the pieces of the true cross that, that are um extant today it, it's it's it'll be huge right it's way way too big everyone's got a piece of the cross um but it's not just with jesus too though like it's 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 Christian saints, we have contact relics of of other saints as well. Um, uh, um, a girdle of Mary, for example, is is a contact relic of hers, because Mary too was assumed up into heaven according to at least the apocryphal Domitian account. So we don't have any pieces of her body either. So we need contact relics. Wow. Um, so yeah, every church has to have either a, a, a bodily relic or a contact relic in order to to attract people, but also to add to the esteem of the church. Have some kind of contact. With the with the ancient world, um, it, it reminds you of these restaurants. Like there's a restaurant in Toronto where they have Wayne Gretzky's stick, and like it's like sort of like the same sort of idea. Yeah, or the uh, what's the Rock Restaurant where it, which has all of that stuff as well. The chain, what's they called? Oh yeah, I forgot what it's called. I know what you're talking about though. Yeah, I don't remember the name of it. Yeah, yeah. people yeah. love their artifacts. And people like their artifacts. They like the, they want to go see stuff. It's I get it. It makes sense. Um, I don't now the the letter from Agbar to Jesus, is that the one that Eusebius translate, or is it the translation of Jesus responding to him, or both? Both are in there, and a little sequel where he talks about sending Thaddeus. Wow. So are you? Do you think that people actually believe that they had a letter from the hand of Jesus? People actually believe this, and when do they stop believing this? Well, Eusebius never claimed to have the original. Like so, he he it was copied from the archive in Syria in Syria. Um, um i got i got yeah um, but thinking about again the image i was going to mention this but i forgot there's a, there's also an apocryphal text called the epistle of lentilus that's fairly wide known and that that's supposed to be from a roman uh roman official 
of uh, um, Palestine. Uh, and it basically is just a description of Jesus. Um, and it, he looks, it's a very white European Jesus uh, in the text. Of course, of course. Um, but our earliest manuscript of that, I think, is 14th century. So it's a pretty, it's a medieval text. Though there is a, there is another text, uh, one of these Coptic texts I was mentioning earlier that has a description too. Um, so we have a few examples of that. But but this this letter from Lentulus, he's supposed to be a first century guy who's met Jesus and he's describing him. Um, again, no one claims to have had the original letter, but um, it, it gets there in a way of here you have the person who was there who wrote the letter and I have a copy of it now and I can tell you what's in it. So yeah, we don't have the original Abgar Jesus letter, but um, um, we have um, we have copies of it and we have what Eusebius has. And one interesting thing about some of the copies too, um, it includes these, these, um, these letters at the end. Uh, so this uh, an abbreviation for the name of Jesus and then a few letters that represent certain words connected to the divinity of Jesus. And these are like magical symbols. And so uh, this is interesting to play between apocryphal text and magic where you could, you would display this letter in your home and it's supposed to put, uh, give a blessing on your home. Because also in the in the letter there, um, the letters. Well, I'm backing up just a little bit, but um, so the letters go back. Uh, our, our letter of Abgar comes to Jesus, and Jesus' letter comes back. And those two letters were used. Apparently, we find out from a writer of the fifth century. They were attached to the city gates of Edessa, and a, added in that version of it is Jesus saying um, that to Abgar, your kingdom will not fall. Um, this is because of this blessing that I give you. So people use that and transfer that blessing to their own home. So they display the letter with that statement that no harm will befall you and with those magical kinds of characters on there. And a similar kind of thing happens to um, the Epistle of Lentulus, like because it was so widespread, uh, it was even published in what's called broadsheets, so just like a, like a, a sheet of newspaper. Uh, and people would affix it to their houses, and that would give, they believe it would give them some kind of uh, protection on their homes. Um, and there's other examples of that kind of thing happening in our text occasionally, where, where you know, magic things, um, uh, putting uh, this will be like a text of Michael the Archangel, for example, and it says if you write Mark, the Archangel Mike, Michael's name on your home or on your dishes or something like that, it, uh, it'll protect them from harm. So. Um, we have those weird little interplays between the, the stories and uh, something that can provide you with some kind of a, a blessing or charm or protection. That's fascinating. Now, I just want to, I'm going to read for people who are interested in the translation. For, this is just from Wikipedia, but this is supposedly what Jesus said to Agbar. And it's, it's, real, it's real short. He says, blessed are you who has believed in me without having seen me. For it is written concerning me that they who have seen me will not believe in me, and they who have not seen me will believe and be saved. But in regard to what you have written to me, that I should come to you, it is necessary for me to fulfill all things here, for which I have been sent, and after I have fulfilled them thus to be taken up again to him that sent me. But after I have been taken up, I will send you one of my disciples, that he may heal your disease and give life to you and yours. And it's just very typical for what Jesus would say based on earlier sources, what he says. You yeah, know? it's very John-like. Um, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, including the, the phrase, the one who sent me to you is very much from John. So it's, it's certainly drawing upon Johannine language. So it sounds very familiar to us, yeah. Now, I wonder how well-received this was because Eusebius is pretty popular. Do you think people just believed it or was there any disputes on this? It seems to be. I think you know Eusebius can, kind of gives it that 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 badge of authenticity, and right. so um, it, it it occupies that that odd space in between canonical and non-canonical. Then doesn't it as something that's considered authentic, but it's not in the Bible. Um, but he puts his stamp on it. We and but it's a similar kind of problem we see with some of the uh, some early church writings, like um, some stuff by Justin Martyr or people like. Uh, uh, the, the epistles of first and second Clement, which are considered orthodox, but have sayings of Jesus in them that are not found in the Bible. So does that make those sayings canonical in a way? Because it's it's approved by er, an early church writer. Um, and one another thing that we do in the volumes, um, 
um, is sometimes present some stories of New Testament figures that are passed along by some of these church writers. We have a story, for example, of the Apostle John from Clement of Alexandria. So it's not it's not its own separate text, like an Acts of John or something. It's not from the Bible. But Clement of Alexandria is telling this story about John, and it's clearly, you know, not true. It's it's a legend. But does that make it canonical? It's just such such a, a weird gray area. Uh, so Abgar is a good example of that, and and these that story of John as well. Interesting. The last thing I want to ask you about is the pseudo apostolic memoirs, and they're a, suppose a, I'm supposedly some pretty interesting connections between those and the Nag Hammadi text. And what do you think, what are those? Yeah, so I mentioned the apostolic memoirs earlier as these Coptic texts, fifth, sixth century, building, you know, the church of the time. Um, one of the things uh, I find interesting about them and, and you know, connects with, with your interest to some extent, since you're called the Gnostic informant after all, sure. um, is that we sometimes see some uh, terminology that we find in Gnostic texts in these texts. Um, for example, there's one of them, I uh, can't remember which one it is, but it uses the, the, the um, oh, it's uh, investiture of the Archangel Michael. It uses the, the, the terms uh, sackless for the devil, uh, which is something we find in the Nakamati Library about the, the creator of this world. He's called sackless or yelled about off. Um, or Demiurge, we have another one, um, I think it's the, the, yeah, I can't remember which one it is, but it uses the term Demiurge for God. So. What I think is interesting about that is, is you know, we tend to think of, um, you know, Orthodox Christianity in Egypt as having this shape, which is mostly, you know, what we find in the Bible. And then we have the Nag Hammadi Library with all these horrible things in it, uh, horrible theology that, 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 that the Orthodox don't like. But these texts that are being composed in, in Coptic in the same area, well, they seem to share some terminology between them. And right. um, I think when you, when you, see those kinds of connections that's um that the night Commandia library starts to look less remote as a result that um it's all part of the the developing christianity of the area certainly different flavors um but if they're using the same terminology they don't look quite so different from one another and you have to remember the the the, the night Commandia library um you know the the art the, the the origins of it are a bit murky but uh we believe that the texts come from graves of like, one grave, pro but probably more graves of a monk. And so this would be a monk in the next near, nearby monastery who valued these texts or multiple monks in valuing these texts. So they read them alongside canonical stuff that they would have read within the monastery too. So within monasteries, people are reading these texts alongside canonical stuff and alongside maybe the Coptic apostolic memoir stuff. And it's all being circulated and being mused upon and thought about. And, you know, within a century or so after the Nakamati Library was, was buried, we start to have some very clear and fast divisions between what's canonical and what's non-canonical. But I think before that, it's just people uh, find a text that, that's interested, that they, they're interested in, in their library, or they you know, someone a copy of it. And it just becomes part of the things they read and, and uh, uh, um, get ideas from. Wow, that's very, very fascinating with the connection with the Nag Hammadi text. Um, but yeah, if you anyone who's watching this really wants to explore that more, the link's in the description for the books and your website. And um, yeah, is there anything else that you want to say before we close out? Well, that's putting me on the spot. Um, uh, not particularly. I do. I, I do have a, a, a Twitter uh, account too that I um, uh, put some things up on, and and I'm part of an organization called the North American Society for the Study of Christian Apocryphal Literature, NASCAL, and we have a website nascal.com which has a bunch of resources uh, for the study of these texts, free to use, uh, open access, and. Uh, uh, yeah, I urge people who are interested to take a look at that site and see what kinds of things you can find. Fascinating. And um, that, uh, once again, I'm very, very thank you for your time again. And you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.